everyone, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Uh, today, I'm excited about this topic, as I always am about the topics, but this one is something uh, I've been looking at quite a bit. I've been on the ground where this one happened, studied it a lot. We've had discussions on the channel about this in the past, so it's great to get another angle and to talk about a new book about it, and really exciting. Uh, and also, we've got some, finally getting some lighting updating. Hopefully, it's okay. Still playing with it, see what works the best. But the tech is getting better here at OTD, which is always nice, thanks to my patrons. So thank you for everyone who has contributed and helping me get better and better. Next is hopefully a new camera and the laptop that doesn't go crazy on me half the time. So that will be nice. So anyway, today's guest is Sean, uh, Sean Claston. He's written a book on the fighting at Brettville and the days after Normandy, uh, a tour guide in Normandy and has a great website and all other kinds of books. So there's lots we got to talk about today. So it's going to be an exciting one. And as per usual, if you have questions, comments, feel free to put them in the sidebar and uh, we'll answer them to the best of our ability. But uh, we're going to get going and we'll start just by, uh, as we always do, asking Sean how he's doing and why he's doing what he does. Hey, Sean, how's it going today? Yep. Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, hello, good. everyone. Yeah, like I was already telling you, people are very excited for this one. So, uh, and people are uh, already telling me they've already bought a bunch of them about the book. So that's good. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, that's that's always great to see. Uh, that's what I love to see, especially a Canadian book. Yeah. That's of course I am biased, uh, and I do deny that. So, um, as I like I, I told you, and how I always usually like to start these things, how did you come about writing a kind of a self guided tour book about the fighting at? Brettville, how does, how does one get here? Um, right, so when I was younger, I had three things I wanted to do, which is play drums, play football, play cricket. Okay, real football is. Um, I can do each of those to a standard, but not enough to do it professionally. Okay, so I, <laughs> yeah, the only other thing I had an interest in was history. So um, when I was about 25, I kind of settled down a bit and got a job for the working for the Imperial War Museum, at, uh, the, what's now called the Churchill War Rooms. I did that for 11 years, um, came to Normandy on holiday with my kind of long-standing, long-suffering girlfriend, Jackie, um, several times and just loved the place. And one of the things I liked about it was the, the tangibility. You know, you, you, you go somewhere and you, you look and go, this, this is here. I'm using either photographs or maps. You know, it, it kind of comes to life when, when you're there. So um, after a few years, say, at the museum, I, I decided or we decided to do, it would be nice to have a bit of a change. So um, I started work as a tour guide in 2004 with Paul Woodage um, from World War okay. II TV. Um, did that for a few years, then worked with another company um, and then um, decided to go kind of solo. And with the Brett Belog Airs, um, it was always the kind of the, the final stop of the Canadian tour, the Juno tour. So we started on Juno right. Beach and went all the way through and finished at Brett Belog Airs. Um, and it always felt, because of the nature of like a one-day tour, a bit rushed. So <laughs> I just always had this idea about delving a little bit deeper because it's not, I mean, it, it's it's both simple and not simple, what, what happened there over that kind of day and a half, two days. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of the short version of how I ended up writing the, uh, writing this. Um, yeah, uh, if that's a sufficient answer. Uh, yep. <laughs> hey, that, if that's, uh, that's what you got, that's what you got. I mean, it makes it makes sense, right? Because I've, uh, like I said, I've been there myself and did a tour. I mean, it was far more in depth than the typical one day or kind of thing. But yeah. uh, hearing that from you, uh, and but also I've heard it from other tour guys as well about how th there's more here in terms of on the ground in Normandy, and it's just it's it's missed, and mm -hmm. there's a lot to cram in. So getting it and trying to do it at a deeper level is particularly important. I mean, this battle in and of itself, and the surrounding other little battles and of themselves are, are so interesting to me. I mean, it's one of the ones when I when I first learned about the intense details of this one. Um, that really stuck with me. I mean, and it's all the connecting ones as well that are all around this because it's in one kind of area. So um, I want to ask about the, the fighting in of itself, and then maybe we can move to the book later. Um, if you could just kind of give an overview uh, of what's happening here and how the fighting in Brettville develops. I'm going to pull up just one of the maps from your book. I'm not going to show anybody anything else because they should buy it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the map is helpful because it's also a great map that I've seen myself. So it's a great okay. one to have. Right, so um, Brevilogia uh, sits still well, astride the old main road from um, Paris to Cherbourg or Contebello in this sense. And uh, it was the kind of on what they call the Oak Line, which was the kind of ultimate objective 
um, for D-Day for the 3rd Canadian Division and 7th Brigade. Um, and amongst those, of course, Regina Rifles um, had the job of taking Brett Volog Airs, uh, which you can see on the map there, just kind of uh, well, on the leftish. Uh, almost to the end. Yeah, yeah, and the black line is yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the, the black line is the railway line, which runs not parallel, but roughly parallel with the with the N13 again from from Paris to to Cherbourg. Um, so um, D Day being D Day, not everything goes according to, to um, everyone's wishes. Um, so there were delays. Um, Regina rifles get to their kind of intermediate objective, um, the Elm line, which is roughly halfway. And the next day, they they managed to secure uh, Brittpologiers. And also just south of there, south of the railway line, there's a little village called Nore en Bessam. And um, from Nore, this is one of the kind of advantages of visiting. You you get some idea about in, in Normandy around this area, there, there is no there are no great big hills, um, but just a, a little bit of elevation can offer you kind of a much um, broader perspective. And um, so um, by securing Nore, they have a, a decent view um, across to any ground upon which the Germans are going to be moving. Um, in their somewhat inevitable counterattack. Um, so, if you imagine um, on the way you got beyond the yeah, okay. So on the seventh of June, as they're getting there, um, you also have the first of the kind of major twelfth SS division counterattack. So they've been based around Lisieux. Morning of D-Day, they get the alarm um, and they start moving towards the invasion front in a, in a fairly kind of piecemeal fashion. And um, by the morning of the 7th of, of June, um, the neighbouring brigade uh, for the 7th, the, the 9th Canadian Infantry Brigade, um, the Sherbrooke Fusiliers and the North Nova Scotia Highlanders have pushed down through OT to Francville. They were hit with a fairly massive um, um, or fairly uh, intense counterattack and pushed back. Um, and the Reginas are then forming a little bit of a salient um, with the Canadian line being pushed back towards um, uh, Villon de Buisson, which I think is at the top there, um, or maybe just off it, but is there. So, um, yeah, so you have this salient. So the Germans are planning basically a three-division counterattack towards the coast, and in order to do that, they need to remove this salient of, of um, Canadians, and um, that leads to the fighting in and around Brettville on the night of the 8th into the 9th um, of June, so just a few days after D-Day. Yeah, right. And, and, and I think that's important to remember is the actions um, uh, to the east in Auntie. And uh, you can barely see it here. But again, the, the, what happens at the yeah, Abbey Ardennes and everything that is very well known, particularly to viewers. Uh, but this one, it's kind of, and I'm sure a lot of people here watching and will be watching in the future have read Mark Spilner's book on this. Someone mm -hmm. already mentioned, sorry, I forget. So they had all your all these books out, including yours, to uh See if I can find it. So There's quite an extensive list <laughs> about uh, getting prepped for today because it can be a little confusing in terms of, mm -hmm. of uh, here. Yeah, KG is watching and watch frequently. It's our book, yours, and, and uh, Steve uh, Zagawa. I hope I said that right. Uh, about all of this and the idea of stopping the armored counterattack. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting part of the battle and everything. And I think you kind of uh, alluded to something that I know Mark Milner has said from the book and who I took the battlefield tour with that I took, which I was very lucky to be able to do, um, is that particularly Nori is a, was set up as the brigade fortress. That's the word that's used. And, and I was wondering if you can, you talked about it a little bit, but can you talk about kind of, again, what that area might look like a little bit? Because that's included in your book. Again, I don't want to show people because I want them to buy it. But I, I, about what the kind of terrain looks like more generally. Because again, I've been there. It's kind of hard to for me to yeah. describe and you do this all the time. So, and you live it's, in it's, Norway, so. It's, it's pretty flat basically, um, but there are undulations. And they say, you've got, you know, Mark, there's, you see the blue line is the, is the River Mew. Yeah. So the River Mew um, is, is a ditch, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it, it is really just a ditch. It's just a few feet wide. Right. Um, but it's, it's a kind of mild depression sort of thing. So um, you've got this little kind of dip in the ground there. And from Norre, you can see across, um, you can see Carpacay Airfield there, I think, or Carpacay Village. Uh, you've got the road that runs to the west, goes towards Comon Levante. And um, that was kind of like a main archery, uh, east-west archery. Um, so you can basically right. see that the, all the way across to that main road from, from Norrie and Bessin. And um, so, of course, all these roads are going to be used by any German forces that are moving up. Um, so from the right. east, you've got the 12th SS Division. From the from more, more directly south, you've got the Panzerlehr Division coming up from Le Mans. And um, so, yeah, any observation over all this kind of road network is going to be extremely useful. Yeah, um, I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, um, yeah, I, I say there's this slight undulations. It's broken occasionally with little copses, 
Mm. Um, it's not the Bocage, it's not hedgerow country like yeah. where I live, um, but it's, you know, you've got these little kind of patches of woodland you can see, and there's a few hedges, and some of the the, the, the roads are tree-lined. Um, but yeah, it's, right. um, it's, it's quite, um, it's an interesting um, landscape. Yeah, it, 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 to me, it's interesting, and a, and a part that you mentioned in the book, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit, because um, again, I haven't been here in, oh geez, when did I go, 2016, so I'm sure things have even changed since then, but you talk about... Mm -hmm. Parts that are kind of the same, parts that have changed. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about generally kind of your sense of what it was like or what you're from your research and your experience, what it was like then and kind of what it might look like now just to kind of get people a little more, I don't know, in their minds <laughs> suited to what the ground kind of looks like, but what has changed. Because again, I know yeah. things like this have changed and this map is a period map, so it's not 100% accurate of <clears throat> today. No, so the, the biggest change is um, urban expansion. So the Brettville is relatively close to Kong, so it's within what you might call the Kong commuter belt. Um, it's um, the Strider Main Road. It's got a railway station, so obviously it's quite kind of you know a handy place to live in in terms of infrastructure. Right. Um, on the railway line there, just directly south of Brettville um, is uh, Cardinalville, and that's now basically part of Brettville. Um, it's it's all kind of expanded, and also to the north, uh, it's expanded a fair distance as well. Right. Um, but there's still parts of it where the older buildings kind of um, indicate where the older kind of limits were. Once you get right. out towards Norway, Norway has also grown to as far as the railway line, rather than being that little kind of cluster around the trees to the south, it's, it's expanded. So they, all, they almost merge the two villages themselves. Right. right. Out to the east, uh, either side of the railway line, it's pretty much the same, with the exception of the main road, which is now there's the, the new N13, shall we call it, kind of splits the area between the railway line and the old main road. So along that little kind of corridor there, um, they're the kind of biggest changes. Um, but even with those changes, if you visit either um, physically um, or even virtually using Google Earth or your favorite means of doing that kind of thing, uh -huh. um, you can see a lot of stuff which, you know, is, is, is pretty much the same. And so one of the things I've, I've kind of tried to do as much as possible uh, is that all the locations I mentioned in the book, as well as visiting the you, you can go there on Street View. Yeah. You know, to make it, you know, my, my kind of um, uh, my job, as I said earlier, is just to make things accessible to people as a tour guide. And yeah. if, as if we can't do that because they can't afford to travel or they can't, they're not able to travel for any reason, or there's some kind of pandemic or anything like that that could happen, you know, yeah. um, we know. there's another way of doing it. I mean, the idea, of course, is you, you come here and do it on the spot. But if you can't, that's the kind of the, the, the second best choice sort of thing, you know. So, um, yeah, I tried as much as possible to make the locations accessible virtually as well as um, um in in, uh, in a physical sense right i think you, you do a great job of that we were talking uh, just chatting before about um just the way you've written the book i mean it was really really good for me like because again i've been there but i wasn't responsible for the driving actually uh, mm. david was watching was <laughs> uh, and same with mark Milner. uh but like things like that you don't you might not think about right is the idea of what can i actually do and where can i actually go uh, and mm -hmm. what is you know and, and an issue that comes up in battlefield tours and guiding in general is some of this is private property and, and mm -hmm. that's an interesting element that you talk about in this book as well is some of this is private property um one in particular i think is interesting and you mentioned already is cardenville that one is it speaks i don't know for some reason that engagement and i know i'm not the only one scott watching as well is really interested in that one uh because of a family connection but uh, it's it, it's a really interesting one to me. And I think and I was hoping you can kind of shed some light on this because I think I'm still confused. It's called a farm, but it's not wasn't actually a farm. No. Was it? It, was, it was an actual factory at the time as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, linen, so, uh, linen. So Normandy is I think it still is one of France's or if not France's biggest linen producer. So there used to be a linen factory there. So Cardinalville Farm, there is a Cardinalville Farm, but it's the other side of the railway line. It's the, it's the kind of a little black dot to the south. So Cardinville Farm is there, but Cardinville Linen, Linen Factory is the Cardinville Farm that was occupied by um, uh, D Company of uh, Rihanna Rifle Regiment um, in their yep. um, engagement on the night of 8th, 9th of June. So, yeah, so now um, there's a couple of it because it's right beside the railway line. So you've got the old, um, the, the, the guy that used to man the crossing, whatever you call him, on the railway line. You've got his house is still there. You've got part of the old farm is still there. Um, you've got the entrance is still in the same place, but the most of the, the old buildings have gone. And it's now a, um, a company that make cranes for construction. Okay. So it's easy to find because they've got these cranes. You know, yeah. um, right. <laughs> head for the cranes if you can't find it. 
Um, but it has changed. But again, you know, once you stand there and you can see, you can see, you can't cross the railway line. I want to stress this. Please do not try and cross the railway line. Um, it's blocked anyway. Um, but you know, mm. you can still see where it was. You can see the farm across the other side. You can see, you know, where the gateway is and was and and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, there's still this kind of tangible sort of element. Um, and then at the moment, although this could change, of course, in the next few years, depending on levels of construction, you can see across towards Norion Bessin. You can look back towards Brett Logiers itself to see the you know, the church, et cetera, where yep. a company headquarters company were. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a, a neat place to visit. And you can, which I think I mentioned in the book, uh, take a kind of slightly convoluted route, but go across the railway line and then along to yep. Cardinal Farm, which is what you might call the German side of things. Um, and that, for me, has always been interesting, just to see the proximity of things. You know, how close these guys were to each other. Um, yeah. Not only that night, but the next couple of nights, because the Germans were there till the Lamenna Patria attack on the 11th of June, on the Sunday. Yeah. Um, so yeah. for a couple of days, there's just this couple of hundred yards of um, nothing. <laughs> well, yeah, which is, yeah, which is one of the things uh, shocking to me, and what's shocking and, and intriguing about all of this is when you get on the ground, you realize what that actually means. Like, I'm... I still, I can picture it because I've stood there, and I can still picture in my mind of what this looks like. Well, at the time, I mean, mm -hmm. like you said, there's always this, there's always development, particularly in Normandy, which is a good thing. People live there. And yeah, development yeah. is good, which is always another issue uh, that some people have strong opinions on. But uh, I mean, looking across, like you said, looking across the rail line, and I went, "This is really close." <laughs> it was really, really <laughs> close, and I was like. Oh geez, this was an interesting idea. Um, anyway, we can come back to that because I want to. I want to talk about more generally if you can kind of walk us through a little bit about kind of how the fighting in in Brettville itself takes place. Maybe you already mentioned it, but we could start by talking about who's what's going on, what what the Germans are doing because I think that part sometimes gets misunderstood a little bit and, and kind of what the thinking they were trying to do there specifically with Brettville because I've heard all kinds of stories <laughs> things that happen there and there's just a lot of them are just like why would they do that um, kind of thing so if you could if that's okay if you could just kind of walk us through a little bit of what leads to this basically intense crazy fight overnight in redville okay so on the seventh when the reginas get to um the oak line you've got um, c company and nori on Bessin. A company um, in Brettville itself with their quarters company uh, around where the church is, so right in the middle of the town. Yeah. Um, I had a little bit of help here from Kevin Lambie, who runs the Regina Rifles website, because I kind of interpreted things based on some other sort of secondary sources. And it turned out B Company, which makes perfect sense. Uh, we're just south of the railway line. Um, and then you had um, D Company, uh, who um, in uh, La Ville Neuve de Rogue, which is just where the River Mew crosses the main road. And uh, they come under a fairly heavy attack um, on the night of the 7th, 8th of June, or early hours of the 8th, really. Um, so they get pulled back um, and they end up going to Cardinalville. Uh, Cardinalville had been occupied by carriers from the Winnipegs who are in Puton Bessam. And then the Regina's carrier platoon gets split. So they had been around the railway station, which is directly north of Norion Bessam. And there's two, two, um, two platoons stay there. The others go up to, um, sorry, two sections stay there. And the others go up to the entrance of Brettville, um, so on the, on the eastern entrance, just outside the, the, the town. Um, uh, so the Germans, you've got um, over uh, the, the battles around against 9th Brigade, that's the 2nd Battalion of the 12th SS Panzer Regiment and elements of the 25th uh, Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which is one of their two infantry um, uh, regiments. Um, yep. Most of the attack, well, in fact, the attack from the south um, was the 26th, elements of the 1st Battalion, 26th, and particularly 1st Company under a kind of rather nasty individual called Wilhelm Monka. And um, so um, he uh, his uh, his first battalion was commanded by um, Krauser. And um, so they, they they were kind of doing the initial job of trying to kind of, you know, push the Canadians back. Um, D Company fall back to Cardinville. Um, and then that sort of sets the stage for this kind of night attack uh, on the night of the 8th, 9th of June, um, where the kind of the salient is, from a German point of view, hoped to be kind of eliminated in, in full. Uh, I should stress as well, on the 8th of June at the same time, over in Puto and Bessin, you've got um, uh, raw and big rifles um, getting a bit of a mauling, I'm afraid, uh, until it's kind of, you know, things kind of stabilised. And then you've got the 3rd Battalion from the Brigade, Canadian Scottish, who kind of helped stabilise things back there. So there's already a lot of stuff going on with the 2nd Battalion of the 26th Regiment uh, uh, um, over in Puto. So it's all kind of fairly kind of chaotic and a bit sort of, uh, messy um hopefully um the description and the maps in the book 
give some kind of. <laughs> I, I mean, I think they do. I, I mean, things, yeah. that's right. That's why I just wanted to kind of give one now because it is. I mean, it, it, like I, I know, and Paul Paul Woodridge from World War II Devia said this when he was on the channel, and he's mentioned this many times. Is the Canadian story is is one of his favorite to tell because it, it's almost it's almost literally linear in how it progresses. <laughs> Literally, right? It's almost literally a straight line. I mean, it takes a bit of a you know a sidestep a little bit, but I mean, it's almost literally a straight line, except for this part because it's it's a broader front, but it's also confusing because of where the German counterattack is coming from. I mean, I find that yeah. sometimes confusing because again, and like you just said, the River Mew, which is a stream, and a few of them in Normandy look like you could jump them, and I wanted yeah. to, but people talked me out of doing it, which was probably a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Because we have a bit of a different definition, I think, of rivers here in Canada yeah. than they do well, in, in Normandy. Look at that map, as, as, a, as a Canadian looking at that map, you would probably expect the River Mew to be not necessarily substantial, but you know, in, in need of a bridge. But you, you know, you can drive across it. You know, yeah. it's a. <laughs> it's it's just sorry, that's just, yeah. Yeah. that's just something I like to keep in mind too, and, and particularly in Normandy because it becomes so important for the Canadians fighting, but particularly later on, right, when they're trying to get out of Con, uh, and then also trying to close the gap. I mean, these tiny, tiny little streams is what we would call them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Might as well become raging rivers to the Germans because of yeah. what that happens. Well, but anyway, so so that's actually the least of a question. So at this point, there's been nothing happened to the bridge over the Mew. It's, it's not an issue. The Germans don't really have a mobility issue at this point. No, so you the the the, the Mew is um, where the main road crosses um, the, the Mew. Um, you wouldn't even notice. The, the, the only way you notice is it's a, it's a sign on the wall saying that Mew. Um, it, it's 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 say it's a ditch. Okay, there's, there's no there's no issue there at all. Um, so um, the the first battalion of their tank regiment is um, equipped with Panthers. So these are 45 tons, which would have maybe an impact on smaller bridges, but you know it's not an issue there at all. Okay. And also, yeah, it's so a main road. You know? It's not traffic's not like it is today, but it's it's a it's a main road. So you know, it's 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 been used for a, a long time. Actually, yeah, well, yeah. Well, we just had a question, which I you think you answered it. Is is, is 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 the ground soft? But if it, it can handle those tanks, then clearly it's okay. Because yeah. again, yeah, I think that that's always one of the questions, right? And and the things that are important is the element of the engineering and the bridges and control, and particularly. Mm -hmm. As the fighting develops, uh, one thing I did want to ask, and because you've done this research for a long, long time, is and a thing that's kind of connected, I think, popularly in Normandy about memory about Normandy is Allied air control. Were the Germans mm -hmm. concerned about this at this point? Were they moving more or less freely at this point? Was that a concern for them? Well, that's like one of the kind of issues in them getting to the front in the first place. Um, so both. 12th SS Division and Panzerlehr Division are arriving in kind of um, smaller elements they'd like than they'd like because of, at least partly because of our air power. Um, whether that threat is as real as they think it is, is another matter, but it is in their minds, certainly. So um, there's a tendency to move preferably at night time. Um, yeah. If you look at photographs of German vehicles in Normandy, they're just strewn with branches and foliage as a kind of means of, you know, which is fine when you're static, but trees don't move that quickly. So, you know, um, and uh, at this time of year in Normandy as well, which is something else in various parts of the world might, might not be obvious, it gets dark at about 11 at night and it's light again yeah. at five. I mean, not proper light, but, you know, light enough to see easily by enough. five. And then yeah. the first kind of dawn, rays of sunlight around half past three, four o'clock in the morning. So, you know, you've got this very short window. If you do want to move only at night, you've got this very short window. So they're kind of forced to move during uh, daylight. And um, one of the, yeah, I mean, uh, example, the bridging platoon of the 12th SS Division's Pioneer Battalion, they were pretty much wiped out by Allied air attack uh, and then moved okay. to the front. So, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not arriving in the in a kind of the massed formation that they would like, even though Lisieux is not that far. You know, it's not, you know, right. not the other side of Paris. It's still in Normandy, still, you know, yeah, but yeah. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's certainly an a, an issue. Um, and as I say, even if 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 they do in their own minds kind of overplay that threat, if it affects them, then then brilliant. <laughs> you know, if it, if it, anything that can delay them is is a good right. thing, isn't it? You know. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's the, I guess that's kind of what the root of the question is, is because there's, I think when it comes to air power in general, there's the concept of 
what actually happens and what they you know the enemy thinks can happen right mm -hmm. uh, things are going to be done differently if you think a threat is is you know is imminent and how you go about that because again and i think it's it's come up before because we did i did a show with mike bechtold who's also great about mm -hmm. the seventh brigade just generally so the whole you know their move from the beaches through to this mm -hmm. and just a little bit beyond but the idea that came up a lot because also Mike is great with the, uh, he's an air power historian as well, is the lack uh, of air power. But, and as we, you just mentioned, it's, it's further inland. That, that's not what it's doing at this point. It's trying mm -hmm. to stop reinforcements from getting through mm -hmm. to begin with. And also, which comes up pretty much every time is how difficult it actually is to provide yeah. direct air support at this particular yeah. point in the war against even armored columns. Uh, whatever mm -hmm. form that may be uh, it's, it's 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 an interesting part that i just like to keep in mind and i just like mm -hmm. to ask different people's opinions on this based on what sources they've looked at and how they've gone about their experience so and you mentioned um just a bit earlier you were talking about um kevin who who does great work on uh, on mm -hmm. his uh, regiment sorry and he is watching i hope he's still watching so thank okay. you for watching uh, okay. yeah so that, that's great that he you know kind of helped you but that still kind of want to keep talking about the germans did you look any of their sources were using secondary sources uh, how'd you go about kind of getting their side yeah of the story? mostly sort of secondary um because of what i was writing about um and the constraints of a well what was supposed to be eight thousand words ends up being 10 because these things do um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a small book it's not it's not a history it's it's a it's a means of showing you kind of yeah. around an area so um my my german references were limited to the divisional history which is it is what it is it's a little bit um, um yeah. flavored is the right word i don't know we'll use that yeah. we'll use that <laughs> <laughs> there, but it has some interesting personal testimony which is the, 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 the main sort you know that kind of thing which i find interesting you know and you, we can have the debate about the validity of personal testimony another time, maybe. But you know, it's there. <laughs> and for me, if you kind of, if you read something and it's obviously fake, then I, that, that's it. Or if it's a fictional character, of course, or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you um, if if you read something, well, that makes sense, you know. Then if it does tie, I mean, there's, there's no reason to lie, you know, for these these old boys sometimes. Or they're, yeah. Boys. so um so yeah so i, I used a, that for a few of those and then the um the the war diary the ktb of the of the panzer regiment was translated into english by a hungarian called sham weber i think um, mm. um so yeah that's that's basically a direct translation of the war diary so um and i've got kind of various bits and pieces um as well um but you say it, it's it's not a historical work it's a it's a kind of ten thousand word guidebook so uh, yeah um but yes there i, I when when uh, the, the proposal actually was first brought up by a guy called mark pruel i don't know if you know and um he had the idea of doing guidebooks with some sort of you know not just focused on one side so um the idea right. of including some of the, the kind of the german perspective um yep. uh, was, was there from the start because okay. they were there you know. <laughs> well yeah. yeah well there'd be nothing to write about if they weren't there <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, so yeah, so you, you've got a few bits and pieces from the, from there, but I, I do I do try and kind of verify everything as much as possible. So well, yeah, um, and, then, yeah. and and that's how it should be done, I think. Yeah. And, but I think that's another thing because you sent me the, the the PDF a couple of days ago, and I've just been kind of scanning it ever since and digging and looking at it, and I, I sometimes can't stop when I probably you know go to sleep or something. Uh, but uh, it's been a good distraction for me, which I desperately need. Mm -hmm. uh, right now uh anyway so i think that's why i wanted to bring that up is because i think you did a really good job of covering that side of things and and, and trying to understand um mm -hmm. the german perspective on this and because again it doesn't make sense without it right especially this one yeah, yeah. It, it's quite confusing um as i keep saying but it's still true and another confusing part and another one that i'm still confused about is the actual fighting inside brettville i mean you know abstractly in my head i get it been on the ground i've seen you know the famous spot uh and everything mm -hmm. in the church i was wondering again if you could kind of give us your sort of sense of from your research of what happened as much as you can in that city that night or town okay so um the initial german attack uh, was stalling on the outskirts of the town um on the eastern outskirts um where say so the, the two two sections of the carrier platoon um but they they, they eventually were overrun by by a couple of Panthers um, who basically do a kind of headlong charge into the town. And um, by this time, it's 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 dark, or dark enough, you know. 
and that, that's something else which is kind of interesting um I, i've got put a couple of photographs in the book like from now i mean I, in theory i should have done them at night but <laughs> yeah <laughs> pointless yeah um because it's funny because we, we 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 tend to look at this stuff firstly with hindsight which is brilliant because we can tell oh, they should have this should have done it but also <laughs> we tend to visit it during the day and you know, the idea of going through that there's one that i'll talk about in a minute a little alleyway to go through there at night mm-hmm. is it, quite you know daunting you know so anyway so these these two yeah. break through um one of which is knocked right at, knocked out right outside the battalion um headquarters um yeah. by a go with a pit um which were quite effective against panthers especially from 30 feet but you know um yeah. uh, so uh, anyway so this one is knocked out um the second one yeah. kind of hesitates and, and doesn't come any further uh, yeah. a little while later um the german the, the tank regiments tend to have their kind of organic flak and the aircraft vehicles and the 12th assessed got about a dozen of these little uh, check chassis two centimeter flax you know and um they had a very rapid rate of fire okay theoretical not practical but you know what i mean so they, they, yeah. if you watch say from private ryan the two centimeter flak that the guys bring into the town the germans it's the same weapon basically you know so yeah. one of these did a little headlong charge into the village bypass the panther that was also knocked out by by a peer okay mm-hmm. and, and then you've got uh, an infantry unit um, a, a troop, if you like, from um, from the 15th Panzer Day Regiment, 15th Company, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 25, yeah. uh, commanded by a guy called um, Fuss. And um, there's there's two two sections. They're advancing into the town, come under heavy machine gun fire. So there's one group under Fuss take a little fork down an alleyway. And I say the idea of going down there at night, uh, but also the idea of Canadians, because they go right through A Company. So, you know, they can hear these Germans. The, the, the nerves on both sides must have been um, incredible. But, you know, oh, yeah. um, so anyway, so, yeah, um, so the, the the idea was they were going to get to the crossroads of the church. Once they were there, there was no armor, um, Canadian armor. They would fire a white flare and then get their tank support. But anyway, um, yeah. I won't spoil the ending <laughs> too much. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, well, the church well, is featured. That, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. That's right. No, go on. No, I just want to say I want to talk about the the, 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 the attack, uh, the, uh, the fire volley attack after. Okay. By the hussars, first hussars. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So at the time, there's there's no armor. Um, um, although again, one of the things that you know, I wish, I wish maybe a future project, um, but uh, to include some of the units which are kind of, if not overlooked, then skimmed over because it wasn't just the Regina Rifles. You had elements of Royal Canadian Artillery. You had Third Eight Tank Regiment as well. So you've got other kind of units in the area yep. as well. But you know, for for reasons of space and clarity, they're kind of omitted. No disrespect to them, but yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, so the Germans get to the, the crossroads, and this little group are holed up in the church basically for a, for a while. Um, the church is visitable, which is quite nice. And this is one of the things with a kind of veteran testimony. One of them was a guy called Werner Zimmermann, and he describes the inside of the church, and it just matches. So if it was a fictional account, it it, it wouldn't. So that itself adds some kind of validity because there's, there's the stuff he says. There's no there's no need to there's no need for to fabricate. So, you I mean, that right. kind of, you know, the fact that he almost certainly was in the church um, kind of adds a little bit of validity to his testimony. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the part of the, the area around the church is, I think, pretty fascinating. And the thing yeah. what I was saying before is the attack and the confusion at the crossroads. <laughs> the story mm-hmm. of I forget who he was. I should have written it down. Uh, the German who just, there's a, I think it's a staff car, basically, pulls into the crossroads. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you kind of talk about why that happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and uh, there's, there's a story that basically there's this German staff car kind of pulls up, guy gets out and has a look and promptly gets um, dealt with. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's say it's um, it's quite a confusing. Um, <laughs> it's it's still, I mean, I, I, I know I've written about it in that and I've visited loads of times. I'm still, I will confess, I'm still not 100 percent sure. <laughs> okay, I have in my head exactly what happened. Not even well, because like, probably not. But, you know, well, sorry, yeah. Uh, the only reason that's why I ask because I keep hearing different accounts about what yeah. happens. I hear he this. I don't know who he was again. I don't remember. He was in some higher up, and he they pull into the town like there's nobody there. He gets yeah. out of the car, puts a map on the hood, and then gets yeah. you know blown up by a Piat because he's not paying attention. Like that's what I've heard. I've heard he just gets lit up um, by small arms fire. I just, I was wondering, yeah, but if you haven't found anything more, I mean, again, it's, well, so no, it's just that little story. That's, uh, that's, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah. So but there's, there's, there's kind of photographic evidence of the Panther and the, and the Flak Panzer. So uh, 
they're the kind of ones that we're kind of hundred percent certain of. So. Yeah, because that's that's one I think, and that photo gets shared a, a, a lot. Is is the is you know the panther that's basically at that gate, which mm -hmm. is just across the street from <laughs> the gate yeah. of the headquarters at the time. Uh, which, and I'm sure you've taken groups there a lot of times because mm -hmm. it's it's a striking spot to see in person. I mean, I don't think, and I know because I've taken that same photo myself. I have like three of them <laughs> from yeah. the same spot. It doesn't quite do it justice of how close that actually is. Is no. that something? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, just to say, I mean, you look at it on a picture and you think, well, that's close. And you stand there and you think it's even closer. Yeah. It's just, well, I mean, you know, um, you, you could spit at it, basically. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's no distance at all. Um, it's, so, it's um, yeah, and that's the kind of advantage of, um, let's say, visiting these sites in person, isn't it, to, to, to see these things. I mean, you get some idea from a photograph, but, you know, um, on the spot itself, is a, there's, there's no better way. And I say that's that thing about, you know, the, the, the ground itself being kind of a piece of evidence. Yeah, that's a key factor to understanding events, isn't it? You know, if you oh, understand yeah. where they happened, you do get some kind of better grounding. And that's that's basically why I visited Normandy in the first place and why I started doing the job I'm doing, because I wanted to understand things in, in a more rounded fashion. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, um, yeah, so. Yeah, well, I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, it's uh, can't understand yeah. any of this without knowing the ground. I mean, I, I yeah. say that pretty much any time a battle uh, live stream or anything connected to it. Uh, but, yeah, just – and maybe we can – shift a little bit here and go kind of your tour guide side is but but the spot that's why i want to keep talking about because i think it's it's such a good case in point of what we're trying to talk about here is have have you i know you've taken a lot of groups there but like has there been any kind of like what are the reactions of these groups to when they're on the ground and you're like yeah there's you can almost touch it you know this big tank yeah. and you're in a well, little well, hole you know like is that something that just really shocks people yeah, exactly. I mean, that's it. If you if you if you know the area, you know there's a little bus stop there, which is sometimes handy in Normandy because it's you know, green for a reason. Yeah, and uh, so you can stand at the bus stop and say, "Well, this is you know the house to your right is the battalion headquarters. They had a couple of peer teams. There's a guy called Joe Lapointe who was one of them. And um, and then you know you can show the picture of the panther. Um, and then if you kind of hold it up in the same way, you say, "Well, that's you know it's it's there." And there is always. You know, Oh, I'd say always, not even almost always, always a kind of like a, a, a gulp when they realized just how close this thing was. Um, and if you kind of maybe kind of stress the fact that this is a 45 ton tank, um, it's quite impressive. You know, I've been close to the one moving and it, you know, the, you know, the ground shakes and stuff, you know, it's all this stuff, you know. And um, yeah, it, it must have been quite kind of daunting. Um, uh, one of the things I do mention without giving too much away, um, although there's been experience in Italy, for, for these guys, this would be the first panther they'd encountered. Okay? Yep. And how, how did it end up? <laughs> so it's the first one they encountered, but it's also the first one they knock out as well. So that's kind of quite, quite nice. And with yeah, a pit, which is a much maligned weapon, but, you know. Well, I know. I, I mean, that's... Nice as well. You know, you've got this kind of 45-ton um, kind of elite buff and SS type, you know, machine. Uh, and then you've got a guy with a pit who mm -hmm. stops it. I mean, yeah. not just that, but, you know. It's, it's well, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the story too, right, is that's the one that's always kind of brought up because i mean I, I do have a soft spot for the piano i think i always will i mean watching yeah. um bridge too far <laughs> is probably part of the reason i mean that's yeah. one of the first movies i saw when i was a kid because my dad i talked about i've talked about this before but, but a bit of an aside that's one of the first like movies my dad showed me about the second world war which probably led to this whole history obsession that i i do every day uh but like that's one of the first ones i ever saw so i think that's an interesting part of this because yeah like you said the piet's much maligned it's it, it gets it's got its you know detractors and people who love it but i think this is an interesting uh, part to talk about because a the personal mm -hmm. i don't know composure of joe LaPointe to do this because <laughs> yeah. he misses the first one well, he, did, he, he did yeah he fired twice so yeah know. well he didn't miss once, sorry i think it once deflected kind of that's it done you know but yeah yeah twice. like that's crazy to me that he had to reload yeah. and reload in that is take some time, some work, and he did it again, <laughs> like in the dark. Yeah. It's just it's yeah. it's a story. I mean, and I I, I and I'm not saying this is um, this is not just for me, but because Mark Milner and again I've said his impact on me in his book, which if you guys don't haven't seen or read, you should. It's it, he tells like if this was Americans. There would have been, I don't know how many movies made about this stuff. Like Cardinville would be its own movie. And like Brettville would be a movie <laughs> if it was an American. Yeah. So I think that's, it, it's so great that you're doing this kind of 
book because there's i think you know the fellow travelers now of getting the canadian stories out there in a different ways and i think this is is a great one to um to do that because again this is a great story and it's it, it's really and it's an important one because it does it breaks um the german uh, panzer counterattack. and i wondered if you could talk about a little bit about that of kind of that i think that's part of what they're trying to do right they're trying to get the start line yeah. for the attack that never develops. Yes. No, as I mentioned earlier, there's this kind of salient in their lines and it needs kind of eliminating really before they you know, launch what they hope is going to be a substantial substantial attack with these three divisions. And the fact they never never do, I mean, it's it's a non-starter, isn't it? The, the, the counterattack is a non-starter because of this. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, they don't stop that night. I mean, they carry on the next day and actually a little bit later as well. Um, um, but, um, but yeah, um, it does put pay to any of their um, um, realistic efforts, I should say, to, to launch um, a right. significant attack towards the sea. It certainly, well, it certainly plays a major part in putting an end to that kind of idea. Yeah, I mean, because as lots of historians have now stressed with, I think the re-examination of particularly Canada's role in Normandy, that this area is perfect for a counterattack. That's why the Canadians are mm -hmm. given so much artillery because of that reason. Uh, and this is a perfect example. It's exactly what is supposed to happen from the Allied side, and it does. Mm -hmm. And I think that just gets forgotten, unfortunately, because a lot of people just forget um, uh, kind of what happened here and what the Canadians did. And I think it's great to, to, to bring this up. Now, I, I want to shift because I love talking about this story. We're going to I'm going to go back to Cartonville. We started there. We're going back, <laughs> if you allow me. The 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 attack um, that happens uh, and the kind of the counterattack uh, by the first Azars because they're a hometown unit for me. Um, okay. It's so interesting. And 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 Gordon Henry, who Mark Milner talks about a lot in his book as well. I was wondering if the sense of that because I feel like that's different but it's in the same sort of area. So if you could just talk a little bit about that and if that comes up on your tours, if you've talked about that in the past. Yeah. So um, when uh, yeah, so just north of Norian Bessan today, as the road kind of comes around, because it's all changed a bit now. It's much more built up. So that map is one of the reasons included in the map is to give an idea about how little, in terms of um, buildings, um, there there was at the time. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a spot you can stand and you can look over to the left. You can see the railway line is a very slight embankment, and then you can see these kind of open fields and there's a slight rise. And you're looking towards where where B Company were. Um, and on the the next day, um, so you've got basically the fourth, first and fourth companies of the Panzer Regiment. This is Panzer Regiment 12 during the night attack. Um, they have four companies in the battalion, um, second of elsewhere. Uh, but the third company. Um, on the 9th of June in the um, around midday-ish, um, tried to attack um, south of the railway line towards Norian Bessan, yeah. where C Company yeah. were. And um, there's this, there's there's a little bit of confusion. That it's still not again one of the things I'm not 100 certain about. But this seems to be there was a guy Gordon Henry from the First Hussars uh, who was um, uh, positioned in in a, in a place just north of the railway line, probably where there's some industrial sort of buildings now. And um, they just happen to be in exact, almost by chance, in, in exactly the right place. And this this German attack comes trundling across the fields. These 12, um, 12 Panthers, and um, much to their surprise, um, one of them gets hit, and then another one, another one. In fact, uh, seven out of the twelve um, uh, are destroyed in, in a matter of minutes. I think five of them, Gordon Henry, is think credit with five, five of them with his with five his five or four or five. Yeah. 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 Four or five. So um, so yeah, um, it's uh, it. One of the things about these various um, 12th SS attacks was they were, you know, if you read the Canadian Testament as well, they were committed. Okay, they were not enthusiastic. You know, they were, yeah, they were kind of, you know, that's one way to put it. They were yeah. well coordinated. So I think no. in the chat, and you've got like the two Panthers going into the town on their own. Okay, with that infantry, um, you've got the infantry unit under Fuss kind of trying to make their way into the town successfully, actually. Um, but then you've got um, the third company's attack on the 9th of June, um, and they had a small group of about 20 infantry who, for reasons best known themselves, kind of break off the attack early. So you've got um, these tanks trundling across the fields on their own. Um, and I say it's, it's pretty open, and um, they would have been um, tempting targets, I think, to... 
<laughs> That's one way to put it. I mean, because yeah. I, I did, I mean, I've, I've, I want to do like an in depth video on, I've done one on the first Azars, but they literally, when they hit the beach and kind of yeah. with the role they did there. Uh, and I just got away and life. Uh, I want to do more because as we move closer to get into D-Day, I want to get into that again. Yeah. But it, it, to me, it's just it's. I've looked at this action a lot and read the war diaries. I don't even know how many times now. I've read those war diaries a lot. Um, it just, again, I'm just so shocked of what they were doing, the 12th SS. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, no. they just advance in broad daylight in the open and just get literally blown away. I mean, and I just, I don't understand it. I, and a lot of people know this. I feel about this. I don't understand the, the elite moniker. I don't get that they were even that well organized. They were seemingly just trying to, I don't know, think they could intimidate their way forward. I, I honestly don't well, get I think it. That was, I don't read German. The intimidation thing was certainly the case in the night attack. I think, you know, go in with all guns blazing, you know, machine gun and cannon firing. And that would scare the opposition into submission. I think that was kind of a tactic which, you know, had worked elsewhere perhaps um, occasionally. Um, and, uh, yeah, it didn't work. But, you know, and, and, and here, you know, you and if we come to Cardinville in a minute, you've got separate kind of infantry and tank attacks. Neither <laughs> had the um, kind of association yeah. with the other. It's a bit sort of weird. Um, I don't know whether you kind of put it down to a learning curve, um, but... I don't know. Yeah, it's, it just seems a little bit kind of, um, um, yeah, um, maybe naive, maybe, but certainly, yeah, not not very well coordinated. No, I mean, I just, yeah, I don't get it. Well, we have a point here, actually, from from Sheldrake is, yeah, give me a counterattack. Maybe that's why. That's the doctrine that had been mm -hmm. the doctrine for a long time in the, in the German military. Um, I, maybe. I don't know. It, it just seems like they're, they're just thinking they can, yeah, bluster their way forward and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But then again, a bunch of these, you know, Canadian prairie boys <laughs> behind a brick wall <laughs> blow them away. And the artillery, which again is is not talked about as much, which it should be because mm -hmm. it, it's yeah, so yeah, important, yeah. particularly here. Another point again by 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 Sheldrake, who I think everyone knows knows who he is, so I keep calling him by his moniker on here. But uh, he talks about how the artillery starts to break it up. Mark Miller talks about mm -hmm. it. It's it, it's evident mm -hmm. after as well from sources. And I've talked to Scott, who was watching as well about this and. And everything. I think it's important. But what you've done is is provide the context of what's happening at the time, which I think is is amazing. And and I think that's great um, about this. And, and if uh, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask you a few questions about um, guiding in general and maybe just kind of the Canadian stuff, if if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Um, I just is there a particular site and like is this your favorite site favorite i mean i use that term loosely i don't know what other word to use is this like your favorite part of the canadian battlefield to guide Do you like doing something else Do you not yeah, yeah. Like, um, and what's your thoughts on that okay so it's it's probably evident to everybody who doesn't know me that i'm english from my <laughs> lack of accent maybe. um yes. but i've always had this um kind of interest in the canadian effort in normandy um Partly because of the kind of volunteer aspect, you know, the Canadian okay. Army of the time. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the, these guys chose to be there, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe yep. indirectly, but you know, they chose to serve. So um, yep. the, there's that, uh, which I always find interesting. Um, then you're up against a division which was made also of primarily volunteers, at least mm -hmm. ostensibly volunteers. Okay, um, although that division also were fighting other units as well and so on, because they say that boundaries are different on both sides um but i always had interesting yeah. canadian stuff um um from yeah um from juno beach um take I, I don't know because i don't want to sort of <laughs> this is one of my favorite places if you know, using favorite in its kind of loose sense okay this is one of my favorite yeah. places um there's um there's, there's there's two others okay so one is lemon for mm. other reasons because it's not a success okay there's there's no. you know that's you know um this is undoubtedly an allied victory which is obviously gives it another kind of nice edge um but the menopa tree i've always found fascinating partly because although there's the monument in the town where the action actually occurred there's nothing it's right. like a lot of the first world war battlefields you know it's just the kind of open fields and you think well actually yeah a lot of people died here and uh um mm -hmm. it's uh, that's always kind of interested me um and then other places uh san lambo sudif down there um the, the yeah. closing of the pocket with, with, with major curry um but i do like brettville and, and norrie um partly because they, they are they are accessible you know in, in, yeah. in every sense you know the, the idea is i mean it, it's you can you can walk 
what I've described in the book, or you can drive. I mean, I've included driving instructions because that's more hazardous because you know you need to pay attention where you're going in that. But you know, <laughs> half a day or a day, um, you could you could do the whole lot and and kind of hopefully get a real understanding of um, some fairly major events um, in a relatively short, small area, but in a you know a decent amount of time. So I do like it from that perspective. Um, um, also, um, the, the tank we mentioned, the Panther outside Battalion Headquarters. I mean, I've, I've got books from when I was a youngster, a long time ago now, um, with that tank in it. You know, it's just one of the most photographed Panthers, one well, of the most photographed tanks, I would say, in, in, in Normandy, mm-hmm. um, with film footage and, you know, still footage as well. Um, so that in itself, you know, to kind of, you know, I remember the first time actually understanding and being where that happened, um, a photograph that I've been connected with indirectly for many, many years as a youngster it's, right. again it's kind of a bit special when you are it was here you know um so that that's that's always had a nice kind of a um uh, been a nice link for me um but yeah the um the, the the other thing we did touch upon or you did um i don't say lack of recognition because there is recognition but the the lack of wider recognition of the canadian effort i think has been a yeah it's been a problem um not so mm. much maybe in canada but certainly outside it um partly because I mean, in a, in a, they wore what you might call British kit. So there's the kind of, you know, yeah. it's hard to maybe pick them out unless you can see unit flashes and stuff. Um, uh, and secondly, um, yeah, um, uh, I think someone said, you know, you need a Peter Jackson or somebody, <laughs> a Canadian yeah. Peter Jackson to tell the story. But because um, it is, uh, you know, it, it is something I mean, to be really proud of. It, you know, I agree with you. Uh, and I mean, yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. Yeah, there's mistakes. Like you, you, you know, missing Elton Patry is is a mistake, but we only know that in hindsight, right? Like things go wrong, yeah. Uh, yeah. as I always do and more. That's inevitable. But I mean, and I agree with you. I think we need a Peter Jackson. The money is always an issue in this country. We had a mm-hmm. big funded. <sighs> I always ends up having to talk about this bloody documentary. That's not a documentary. <laughs> the power in the horror. Power, the valor in the horror. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, so, so it angers me so. <laughs> Talk about it all the time, even though I hate doing it. it, it because, but that—that that is one of the reasons I think people are, are hesitant to, to to do this because I got my money mm-hmm. pumped into it. They just follow made up their own narrative that fit their own thing, and, mm-hmm. and it just caused a whole row. So I think that's that's part of the issue is why this will probably not happen. I hope I'm wrong, but that's part of it. Anyway, I don't want to spend more time talking about that whole mess. But I agree, like these stories I think are need to be told and I'm trying to do my best and people like you mm-hmm. are as well. Right? And I'm very grateful for you for doing that. And that's kind of what I wanted to ask. It's like you're English living in Normandy and you wrote this book about a Canadian battle, right? And this is like pretty Canadian. Yeah. Like this is one of the few that it's Canadian pretty much to the core here. Because there's mm-hmm. always British supporting arms and all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. This one's pretty Canadian here. And I just yeah. it's so interesting for me to to, to ask. Uh, we have some questions uh, about kind of guiding, if that's okay, um, from Sheldrick. And you don't have to answer this because I know sometimes people don't want to talk about the Juno Beach Center, but it, 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 has it changed anything in your experience? Uh, do you go there? Do you take people there? Right. Okay. Um, I don't go there, but it's no reflection on the center itself. It's basically because if people are with me, um, once we're inside a museum or a Juno Center type building, I'm redundant. If the center's okay. any good, certainly, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you yeah, if, if, if you, I mean, if, if, if you're paying a guide to be with you for seven, nine, ten hours a day, and an hour of that is in a museum, what, you know, we could be out somewhere. And although the Juno Center does a fantastic job in telling Canada's story, I, I, I would say that is pretty good, yeah, on balance. Um, once you're inside that building, you, you could be anywhere in the world. You could be in Toronto, you could be in Ottawa, you could be in Calgary, Montreal, wherever, you know. Sure. Um, you don't gain anything by being in that building in Normandy. Does that make sense? No, it completely makes sense. You, you're, just looking, yeah. you know, you're looking at stuff. Um, but if you go on Juno Beach, you're on Juno Beach. If you go to the Menopa Tree or Brett Bloggers or Norrie, you're there. Um, so I don't necessarily not go there for um, any kind of negative reason reflecting on the centre, but I don't go there because um, people can do that on their own. Right. Um, and um, so uh, either before or after a, um, a, a day with me, if they want any more, then, uh, yeah, that's what I kind of recommend um, doing that. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's a kind of slightly longer that, answer to the question. And sorry to broaden that. Does that go for other museums as well? And all yep. Yeah, there's yeah. very few that I, I go to, to be honest, um, for the same reason. Um, there's a couple where um, sometimes a little bit of extra input. So if they've got kind of large exhibits and stuff like that, 
um, mm. um, but you can add a bit. I mean, the Juno Centre itself has got the stuff outside as well, so it's you know, it does. If, if, if we visit that sector of the beach, um, then um, yeah, you can do the stuff outside the bunkers and the yeah, at least show the location, yeah. Of the tunnels. So, yeah, it's the only way to get in, right? You have to go with a guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't go in there yeah. yourself. Um, but that's a separate thing that you can do, yeah. Uh, I don't know about now because COVID has changed literally all of this, uh, yeah. but anyway, <laughs> the way in the, that was the way in the past, uh, but anyway, yeah, so that, that, that's interesting. Uh, well, I well, I wanted to ask then just generally, do you like Pegasus Bridge, is that something you avoid or do you take people there? Well, uh, no, Pegasus is a bit different because you know, um, they have yeah. their guys, but often they're, they're, they're busy doing their own groups. So if I'm with a group, oh, okay. um, and they want to go in, you know, do kind of stuff on the bridge because it's interesting to point that stuff on the bridge itself and the replica glider and so on. Um, excuse me, I just pour myself a drink of water. Yeah, yeah, go on. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, that one, um, the Airborne Museum in St. Mary Glees for the same reason, to kind of point that stuff on the glider and things like that. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, the others I just, you know, I mean, they, they're yeah. good and there's some excellent museums in Normandy, but I tend to leave people to do those on their own. Okay. Okay, and I, I want to ask this because we have some more uh, audience questions, but we'll get there in a second. Is, do you have a non, what's your non- your favorite non-Canadian site to visit or to guide uh, at, if you have one. Don't know really. Um I mean I, <laughs> I, I, I say again likes a weird word to use, but I like all of them. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I mean my feet are firm on my ground, but I love my job. Um yeah. and so um yeah, I mean I'm not you know, wherever people want to go, um I'm I'm happy doing it. I, I do like some of the out of the way places um uh, particularly but uh and if you've got something tangible like a photograph that matches or several photographs and some stories mm. to go with it that's why brett was quite nice you can stand there and say this True. stuff happened you know within spitting distance of where we're standing that's quite good um and here's the evidence as well that's that, that makes it quite a nice place there um I, was, I, I can't think actually of anywhere anywhere specific outside i mean there, there are some and i'll probably think of it in the minute we close down but you know yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah I, I just love Normandy. It's, it's a you know fantastic place to be. So. Oh yeah, I agree. I haven't been in years, and I want to get back so bad. Um, yeah. All right, I'm just writing that message here. Uh, yeah. So sorry. Yeah, we had a couple questions actually. One from Scott mm -hmm. who I mentioned earlier. Um, we talked about we touched about a little bit, and and you talk about this in the book. So, and I know Scott already has it, but. but um, Talking about the Carbonville site, you, you mentioned it's difficult to get around um, with the, okay, the so, walls and everything. Yeah, so um, hopefully, with the um, benefit of the book, um, you can see what's changed and what's left. So um, the the gateway to the crane yard is in the same location as the old gateway. Yep. Um, one of the things, we, uh, by chance, there was a photograph in the Canadian archives that was not captioned. It was captioned like Normandy, a few days after the invasion sort of thing, but it's actually taken inside the farm. So that's yep. quite nice to you know to to include that, and uh, you can see the gateway and so on. There's you know um, there was a panther that kind of stuck its nose in the gate uh, yeah. during the night. Um, so yeah, you can see that there's a little monument uh, as well. Um, there's um, so yeah, um, it's 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 kind of yeah you it's changed a lot, but it hasn't in the sense that you can still see where it was, how it was, etc. Especially with the uh, hopefully with the aid of the book. Um, you can kind of put things uh, um, uh, in their place. Um, and then you've got the little railway cottage, which is almost on the railway line. And then if you look to your south across, there's the old Cardinalville farm, which is where a group of Germans and the it sour were for, say, for a few days. Yeah. Um, and, and then you'd say you can also kind of follow the, the, the route round and look at it from the other side, which I say is one of the things we've, I found particularly interesting to do over the years. Um, because we're, during the, the, the night attack, um, D Company were surrounded. D Company were interesting as well because they're on their third company commander. Um, first yeah. one was killed. Yes. D-Day. Um, his replacement, um, Jones, was uh, was wounded during the attacks in the La Ville of the Row. Um, yeah. And uh, so you're Gordon Brown, who was, I think, transport officer. Um, mm -hmm. And suddenly, yeah. on the morning of the 8th of June, you're now company commander of an infantry company. Robert Cummings, oh, okay. <laughs> right. And, um, so, and he's literally... given the job of you know, defending this little um, linen factory stroke farm yep. thing um and does a does a rather good job actually uh, but yeah so the the without spoiling things too much the german the, the infantry attack which comes later is broken up by by very accurate artillery fire which is brought mm -hmm. down right in front of them so when these you stand there you think you're bringing down a heavy artillery barrage there um and you know you better hope they, <laughs> that they know what they're doing and uh, so yeah it's 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 quite a, an interesting place to visit um you, i think if you google earth goes um 
past the gateway, I think almost as far as the little railway cottage. And you can go around on Google Earth Street View to the other side, to, yep. to the kind of German farm. Yeah, you can. As well. I mean, yeah. as like I said, I've been thinking about, I think about this battle a lot and I just randomly find myself doing that. I've done it. I've done the whole right down in there. <laughs> and you can, uh, which is great, uh, which is amazing. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to give away too much more because I could talk about that battle for forever. And mm. ever. It's uh, yeah. Sorry, just I wanted to say the way, you're, the way you told about Gordon, yeah, Gordon Brown. It's that's literally it. Like you're, you're, you know, you're in charge now. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. They're like he went okay and just went and did what he had to do. And I think he yeah. did. Yeah. That's job. So he, he's um, again he's very complimentary of C Company commanders as Stuart Tubb, who was a bit more experienced than that. And he said he yeah. was like so reassuring, and his little bit of communication with him kept him calm and just said, you know just. Kind of carry on there. It's, it's quite, yeah. I mean, it's always overall, it's a very grim subject, um, conflict mm-hmm. as a whole, but it does kind of bring out some kind of nice qualities sometimes. Oh, know? yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's one of those, and this is an example I use because no one ever heard of it about just if there's any, you know, sort of uh, comments about the Canadian, you know, effectiveness or ability to fight. It's like, well, they haven't been in combat. Yeah, well, like, at this point, they had for three days and they do a pretty good job. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's just my kind. Um, the, the map I was showing, um, I think I know, it, it's from Library and Archives Canada, correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you can get the GSDS maps um, in, I think that was 150,000 or 100,000, um, but you can get them down to so. one, 125,000 um, on various places yeah. online, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, it's online, I think for sure this yeah. one, but the reference yeah. is in the book. <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, we've had a bunch come in, I just want to double check. Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, just give me one second here. Uh, just yeah, you were speaking about the um, the photographs uh, of, of the buildings. Uh, yeah, this one showing uh, yeah the anti tank and a firefly in some woods. Um, I think that's the, I'm not sure what that would re- reference. To be honest, I can't picture that photo. No. I mean, I've seen these photos. I don't know how many times. No, if, you, if sure. you can somehow share that picture on like Twitter or something like that. Yeah, if someone but, can share that on Twitter or if Benjamin. I, I'm sorry. I, if you are on Twitter or social media, maybe we can answer for that for you later. Sorry, we don't always have all the answers here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure because it depends on uh, everything that's going on. We'd have to take a look at it itself. I was going to do some photos, but I thought, again, they're in the book. So yeah. the book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I think we got our question. Uh, sorry. I don't think that. Oh, geez. We got questions all over the place. Uh, sorry, yeah. something about um, this one. I have no idea. I don't think so. Something about Canadians exploiting the vulnerability of okay. back deck. Uh, yeah, um, uh, white phosphorus was certainly used against German armor by various people. Um, against uh, not just the Panther, but um, any any tank has kind of ventilation for its engine. Oh, yeah. And um, <laughs> uh, so um, firing white phosphorus at the engine deck will. <laughs> Definitely have one, one one result, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was certainly used. I mean, I mean, I read more more use of it by by Americans actually um, than, okay. than Canadians. But, I mean, yeah, it's, which, yeah, I, I, which, it's which a weapon sense. in your arsenal, so you know why wouldn't you? So. Yeah, I know that the the six pounders and the PS did a number on them. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, question here. Nick Bud is asking. No, have to elaborate. I think. Sorry, you can elaborate. If he can elaborate, and my help. Yeah, I don't know that VBFG. I don't. I, I don't. No, no. That one's not yeah, ringing yeah. many bells. Sorry, no. maybe if he's got more details on it. Yeah, we'll get back mm. in a second. Yeah, we got. We have some discussion about artillery shells, which I think has been handled. Um, Kevin is jumping in, which is amazing. Don't talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the Army New Rickles book. Oh, God, she... uh, Benjamin's uh, telling us where it is, but again, I'm not sure. Um, about the photo, we'd have to see it ourselves to uh, to help you with that one. Yeah. Unfortunately, sorry, sorry yeah. Benjamin, I wish, yeah. we had, but we can't share. Um, um, and <laughs> Scott Scott Grimwood is Ameri- the American yeah, Scott, yeah. And, <laughs> talking about yeah. uh, the American use of the white phosphorus, which I think is kind of well known yeah. if you're into this stuff quite a bit. They they use it quite a lot, um, not so much I think in the Commonwealth British Army. Mm. Uh, yeah, unless I'm, we got a bit of a delay, so let's wait and see if. Uh, okay. Oh, actually, hold on. We- we do have a comment here. Sorry, everyone's flying with the comments. I love it. Um, yeah, um, apparently yes. The Canadians would fire away phosphorus. Uh, 
at them and set them ablaze, which is not um, surprising because of the whole mm -hmm. issues that they had um, with all of the transmission and everything that would easily catch fire, um, which is amazing. And it's kind of confusion. Again, this well-designed tank that has this such issue with it. Um, that's not something. Yeah, and then more discussions about um, that. So yeah, so I think that's it. Um, is there anything else you want to touch on, bring up? What, no, are you I doing, mean, just... Are you doing another book? Are you going to be doing more of these? Well, I hope so. I, I mean, that's, that's kind of down to the publisher, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've got um, several in mind, and I, I, at least initially, I, I think I'd like to keep a kind of Canadian focus because it's just it's, it's kind of my my first visit to Normandy was focused around Canadian stuff back in 1994, whenever it was, and um, and that sort of stuck with me ever since. So if I could do something that um, that kind of carries on that, so Capricé is the obvious choice because that's kind of it's uh... kind of Nick's kind of big thing um that's yeah so I've, I've had a kind of couple of walks around places and that looking at that so uh, i might be doing that but um i was gonna ask um, yeah, yeah. next yeah, well, if you Seems know, a good you have, it does i think that's a great choice i mean it's another one that's uh, i think misunderstood um in a lot of ways and is used in online fights i mean it came up i don't know i can't remember a couple of days ago maybe on my youtube comments or something anyway someone was mm -hmm. Getting confused and confused somehow. Kirby, what did they confuse it with? Something really weird and not even connected. <laughs> I think somewhere in the right. eastern. But I went, what are you talking about? Uh, anyway, about the the losses and the tank losses, uh, kind mm -hmm. of the artillery fire of that one. So I think that would be a a good one to cover. And hopefully your publisher agrees. Um, again, I don't mm -hmm. know them. I've been talking to them a little bit because I think they're fairly new. Um, mm -hmm. So yep. I don't know them very well. No, but no, here I mean, you yeah, Sorry, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. Uh, Philip is, I think, summing that up very, very well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it seems to be the is case. Is that having read this one or not? <laughs> I think he has. I think he told me okay. he did. Yeah, excellent. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> No, Philip's good. He's always a great supporter of, of history yeah. and, and historians and people's work. So he's 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 definitely uh, definitely that's a good thing to hear from him. <laughs> he's always getting new stuff. He's always telling me about the books he's buying. He bought one about the the, the stuff taking place. Yeah. I read the book. Yeah. I figured he did. I yeah. thought he told me. And, and, uh, and anyway. it's still by me. That's good. That's reassuring. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it didn't scare anyone away. He didn't scare him off. So that is good. Yeah. Uh, we'll take that as a win. Yeah. So I think that that's it. We had another question about the smoke getting into the crew compartment. That I don't know. Mm. Um, Oh, there was a kind of um, a, um, uh, what do you call it? A grill you, you shut off from the vent. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. close it. The heat yeah, yeah, yeah. inside. Um, so I, I think you could perhaps, I don't know how airtight it was, but you know, yeah, it may uh, be. Probably not very. Uh, again, it depends on the smoke, I think, in the prevailing conditions. Yeah. I would, these things are hard to answer. I think, to be honest, if, if a white phosphorus shell hit my engine deck, I'd be out of there anyway. So <laughs> that's probably a good I call. Uh, yeah, an incinerary near that is. is is bad putting yeah. that mildly yeah. uh anyway yeah so it's uh um that's great to know uh that you're thinking ahead wanting to keep it canadian mm -hmm. um makes me pretty happy uh and uh, mm -hmm. i've got the book and i look forward to giving it a good uh and i'll use it when i do because i'm going to talk about uh this stuff a little bit more on the channel hopefully as we get closer to d-day again i i will use it for sure because uh, mm -hmm. it, it's great to know oh we did miss one more question this is one we will end on this i promise Sorry, I got lost in all the crazy smoke oh. talk. Um, where'd I go? It was a good one, too. Uh, did Oh, was there any like new anecdotes that you learned? Uh, here it is. Uh, while researching or writing. Um, no, because, I mean, it was mostly based on books that I've already got. Um, the only... Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, not necessarily new, um, but sometimes when you read things again, you kind of appreciate them uh, in a way you didn't the first time or the second time or third time, you know? Um, so yeah, um, yeah. having yeah. kind of put things together, because I mean, it's, you know, the more you talk about something or certainly write about it, the more you understand it, hopefully. So suddenly mm. um, a random comment might make more sense than it did on a right. first reading. Does that make sense? Well, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. So not yeah, necessarily new, but kind of, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's what, that's what Bill said, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, so yeah, that's or like that's something is 
Yeah, you understand the context maybe a little better. I mean, like, because that yeah, happened exactly. to me. Yeah. With doing, I did a thread on Kurt Milani, you know, a couple of weeks ago, just because I felt like doing it and stuff. It just it just hit me. Um, it made more sense than like how things were literally laid out and how the buildings and everything were laid out at the time. It made more sense to me. It kind of clicked again. It's I think exactly what you're talking about. I'm sure other people who do this kind of work exactly understand because it, it does it does happen sometimes that you can't sit, you know take everything in the first time and it, it takes some time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you, everyone is singing your praises, which is oh, thank you. awesome. And some people, you've led you on tours from what I understand. Uh, I think I lost it. Um, and you're, but anyway, yeah, lots of people are singing your praises. So that's good. Oh, no, thank you very much. Um, and are, are you going to keep doing the guidance thing once things kind of go back to the normal? Is that, is that on? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I've got no other job. So yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, at the moment, this this coming year, I mean, it, we were, I'm in the off season now anyway. You know, it's, it's right. February, so you know well, so um, that. The year is looking, <laughs> it's looking quite positive so um that's as long good. as every booking i have comes off then it's fine but, oh that's good well, yeah. i know a lot of people are itching to go so hopefully yeah uh, yeah i think so yeah you, you get some of that because <laughs> uh i know i want to get back but i don't know when that'll be but uh hopefully soon we'll see things are coming up in life that uh, that uh, cause me uh, to not be able to do that but we will see and uh, hopefully mm -hmm. we can uh, meet up if, when i get over there that would be great oh definitely yeah yeah and go see some canadian sites maybe <laughs> yeah sure. yeah uh anyway so i'm just going to sign off and then i'll come back and uh we'll be saying goodbye together and that'll be the end of the show today okay cheers bro cheers. yeah i'll be back in a second There we go. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for watching. All your great questions, comments. Again, always great to see the different conversations and discussions that come up in the sidebar, which I do not anticipate. The one on smoke, you know, I've heard about it, read about it, not thought about too much about it, but now I will because you guys are talking about it. So it's great. I always learn, too, from things you don't expect. So I do appreciate that. So, again, thanks for sharing all your stories and everything and your insights. Always appreciate it. So, again, if, if you're new to the channel, haven't heard or are not doing it yet, please do subscribe. It helps very, very much. Um, cause again, the more people that subscribe, the more likely the algorithm is to pick it up. Same with likes and, uh, and comments, please do so. Uh, also, if you want to really support the channel and keep these things going, uh, becoming a, uh, Patreon, sorry, Patreon through Patreon. It's very helpful. Uh, a little bit each month really, really helps me keep this going. So if you can and, and want to see more of this and keep the channel going and the Canadian military history stories, um, please do. Uh, please do become a patron. I know a lot of you already are, but uh, it always hurts to keep, it doesn't hurt to keep asking and getting more and more support. And again, oh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, uh, Sean's Twitter and his website are in the description below. Check it out. And while I've got it muted and I can just sing his praises, <laughs> uh, please do check out the book. It's a fairly new release. So I'm sure a lot of you are, heard about this on Twitter and online. Uh, please do uh, Check it out. I have, it's great. The pictures, the map, the way Sean just tells these stories and, and guides you through this. It, it, it's great. Please do get it. It's, it's not too, too long either, which is very nice. Please do, 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 do that. Get the book. There we go. Sorry, I'm having a bit of uh, issues here with the, with the internet, so it'll probably get time to get off. Uh, so anyway, thanks, Sean, for coming on. I uh, really, really appreciate it, and I uh, look forward to see what you do next. So uh, see everybody, and we'll see everyone next time. Oh, forgot, I have David O'Keefe coming on tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern, to talk about the Black Watch generally in the history of the regiment. So everyone come and check that out, and I'll see everyone tomorrow. Bye, everybody.